Okay, we're going to okay, we're going to get started now. Hi, my name is Chris Marino, and what I'd like to do today is re-record the lightning talk that Robert and I gave last week at the Kubernetes meetup in Santa Clara. Several people asked me if there was a better recording of that because the audio and screen sharing uh, was a little uh, messed up during the live uh, live event. So we're going to rebroadcast that now, and I'm going to split it across two screencasts. I'm going to walk through the presentation materials here in about 15 minutes, and then in a separate screencast, Robert will again perform a live demo of Kubernetes version 1.2, showing third-party resources supporting back-end networking solutions for multi-tenant networks. So what I'd like to cover very quickly is uh, an overview of multi-tenant networking, and specifically uh, cloud-native networks and how the requirements of cloud-native applications are very different from enterprise applications that require complex SDN solutions and virtual networks overlays. From there, I'd like to talk um, in more detail about Romana, which is a new open source project allowing you to build cloud-native SDN, which automates the provisioning and control of cloud-native networks. And we'll drill down into some detail of how that works and then walk through the examples of Kubernetes networking policy. So let me begin by describing cloud-native networks. And I think it's important to recognize the differences between cloud-native applications and legacy enterprise applications and the requirements that they impose on the underlying network. And hopefully everyone is already familiar with the pets versus cattle metaphor to explain the differences between cloud native and legacy enterprise applications. And that's a very useful metaphor, not only to understand the application architectural style, but also the underlying network requirements that result from that. Specifically, cloud-native applications do not need a whole lot of networking support. Quite specifically, Kubernetes network requirements, network requirements is, are really quite simple. All it needs is a reachable IP address. And that simplicity is one of the reasons why Kubernetes applications and cloud-native applications can be deployed across public and private clouds, across data centers. And again, the reason is Again, uh, the reason it's more easily supported is because the underlying network requirements are really quite simple and straightforward. Now compare that to legacy enterprise applications that very often have hard-coded networking requirements built into them, whether they be an I, a physical IP address or the ability to auto-discover a neighboring endpoint through network protocols that run at layer two. For example, ARP on a VLAN can allow an application to discover its nearest neighbors. And uh, that uh, capability is often required for IP address failover, for master-slave recovery, for databases and other enterprise applications. For cloud-native applications, none of those requirements exist. So again, the, uh, the requirements are quite, quite modest. And again, furthermore, the, um, the service orientation of cloud-native applications, again, further decouples them from the underlying infrastructure. I said a moment ago, cloud-native applications are easily ported across public cloud infrastructure, private cloud infrastructure, EC2 availability zones. It really makes no difference. And again, that decoupling from the underlying infrastructure eliminates the need to support more complicated things like vMotion or VM migration or IP address fail IP address failover. So the net result is for the networks, that's really very good news. Cloud native applications don't need any of the low level networking protocols that come along with layer two networks. And it is recreating layer two connectivity that introduces a tremendous amount of complexity when building overlay networks with traditional SDN solutions for enterprise networks. The bad news is 
that layer two networks provided a very convenient way to isolate applications and tiers within those applications. So the good news is we don't need layer two. Unfortunately, we need to come up with a better way to maintain network isolation without falling into the trap of introducing the complexity of layer two SDN. And that's what Romana's cloud native SDN solution can do. It introduces a new layer three based isolation and tenancy model that allows us to vo avoid all of the complexity of layer two overlay virtual networks. And the way it does this is by embedding the actual tenant and segment identifiers directly into the IP addresses. And what that allows us to do is use standard layer three routing in the physical network to forward traffic to its proper destination and also maintain isolation for multi-tenancy. And that may come as a surprise to some people, but it's also important to recognize that layer three has provided multi-tenancy for literally decades on the public internet. Nobody disputes that HP and Coke and Pepsi all maintain their own physical networks. And that's all done at layer three by the routers in the network itself. And cloud native SDN takes advantage of that exact same approach to maintain isolation for multi-tenancy for cloud native applications. And what cloud native SDN can also do is take advantage of the simple hierarchical designs of spine leaf topologies to simplify scalable deployment. The net result here is that no virtual network overlay is required which eliminates all the software complexity of building out those networks and allows applications to reclaim the performance and visibility that comes with running on the physical network. So as I said, all the complexity of virtual network overlays completely disappears and melts away. There are no VLANs, there are no VXLANs, no, I, no tunnel endpoints, no VLAN IDs or virtual network overlay IDs, no open flow, no complex protocols to communicate with host-based virtual switches or overlay virtual networks, all that just disappears. And since we're able to take advantage of hierarchical network designs, we can take advantage of route aggregation to further simplify operations. By taking advantage of the static routing that's in hierarchical network designs, we can avoid the uh, requirement to distribute routes to various endpoints. Again, eliminating the need to run BGP or XMBP or whatever technology is used to distribute routes among endpoints. So the route distribution problem dis disappears. And again, the ability to, route, to aggregate routes not only eliminates the need to distribute routes, but also reduces the number of rules that are needed to isolate networks because they can be applied at the network level versus an individual endpoint level. So overall, this simplifies operations tremendously because all the physical networking uh, infrastructure works, the existing tools and techniques all just work. Diagnostic capabilities that are already familiar just carry forward into new cloud native networks. Existing, importantly, existing security policy and control systems all work, including firewalls, intrusion detection systems, load balancing, etc. So drilling down a little bit deeper, how does this actually all work? As I said before, what's done is the, an actual tenant and segment identifier is embedded in the actual IP address itself. And what that actually means in practice is that for every host and for every tenant and for every segment, they each get defined a different site or length. So for example, a host could get a slash 16 network, a tenant could get a slash 24 network, and a segment could get its own slash 28 network. So what that literally means is on every physical, every host, whether it's a virtual host in EC2 or a physical host in your data center, on every host, each tenant gets a real physical network CIDR. And now that tenant can further subnet that network to maintain their own private segments. And this can all be done provided that the endpoints and the interfaces for that tenant, get assigned an IP address that conforms to this hierarchy. So what 
Romana Cloud Native SDN provides is this intelligent IP address management in addition to the ability to set and configure routes and the layer three firewall rules to maintain this network isolation. So now let's go into a very specific example. Here we have an IPv4 address. We're using an RFC 1918 address where the top eight bits are set to the value 10, which gives us 24 bits to assign as we see fit for uh, cloud native endpoints. Here we specify eight bits to identify the host, which allows us configuration to be up to 255 hosts. We set uh, the next eight bits to identify the tenant, which will allow up to 255 tenants. And then four bits for the tenant, I'm sorry, four bits for the segment and the endpoint ID. So what that means is the hosts, each host gets a slash 16 network, each tenant gets a slash 24 network, and each segment would get a 20 slash 28 network. Now specifically, here's an example where we have three hosts, each with an identifier, uh, uh, host one, host two, and host three, which means that the network that's assigned to the host is um, indicated simply by this, that it's slash 16 network address. Host one is 10.1, host three is 10.3. Now specifically, a tenant on that host would get a longer network address. So for example, on host one, tenant one would get the network 10.1.1, whereas tenant two would get on host one, the network 10.1.2. And then subsequently, individual segments and pods would get longer network addresses. So segment one on ten, for tenant one on host one would get the network address 10.1.1.16. And the 16 is determined because we have set segment one to be bit 28 in the address, which comes up as a 16 slash 28. And likewise, tenant two on host number one would get the appropriate bit set. And then finally, the actual pod endpoints, here's an example of pod number one, which gets an ID number 11 on segment number one of tenant one on physical host one would get the IP address 10.1.27. And then how this would be actually laid out on the physical infrastructure, here's, here are those three hosts, whether they be running on physical infrastructure or EC2 virtual machines, they can be configured they can, be, they can communicate however they need to, but the actual hosts themselves would be configured as the routers with the gateway to the tenant networks. And uh, as you see here in uh, blue, we see tenant one pod, tenant one's pod, pods, and the pink boxes are tenant two pods. And as you can see, the IP addresses have been assigned according to that previous example. So for example, here we have tenant one, uh, segment one, uh, pods number one and two have addresses 10.1.1 and the endpoints IDs uh, .27 and .40 respectively. So those uh, IP addresses uh, match up to the previous example. And again, as I said before, this is all done through a new open source cloud native SDN solution called Romana. It's all open source. It's licensed under Apache. It's all written in Go. And you can find that right now at github.com slash Romana. And there are a lot of details at the project site Romana.io. So now let's jump into a specific example of how we deploy this with Kubernetes using new third-party resources. What you see here is a diagram showing a multi-node Kubernetes cluster and a Kubernetes master. And the way this would begin would be with applying a third party resource to the Kubernetes master, applying the network policy schema. Now what that does is create an API endpoint that can be watched by a listener on the third party resource. In our case, our network policy object listens to that IP address endpoint and watches for changes to the configuration and additions to those resources, at which point we can apply a specific network policy 
or sp specific pods and services. So again, once those uh, objects are applied to the Kubernetes cluster, that would trigger the listener to become aware of those new endpoints, at which point the IP address management module would compute an IP address and the routes would then be determined. And then through a local agent that runs on the Kubernetes node and a CNI plugin, we would set the IP address for the pod and then configure IP tables rules to maintain the isolation that's required in the, in the network policy. So here's an example of what you're going to see in the demo. Here's an example of the third party resource that specifies the network policy. And as I said, it's a third party resource, which has a name that creates a new API endpoint that lives at this URL. So specifying the third party resource name to be demo slash v1, we get this new API endpoint at romana.io slash demo slash v1. And then what we can do is we can apply pod specifications as we normally would. But what we are allowed to do at this point is identify a label, I'm sorry, set a label that identifies which tenant these particular pods belong to. So here, the network segmentation and isolation is set by providing values to the owner label and the tier label. So for example, here, these pods are both owned by tenant one. But we have two different pod specifications, one for uh, the front end and one end for the back end. And again, the tier indicates that these will be uh, isolated uh, collections of pods. And here's another example of using a replication controller with a separate tenant, tenant two. Here we have the owner label specified uh, with a value T2. And again, we're creating three Nginx pods. And then finally, we can uh, apply a specific network policy. And here is an example of a network policy that's being applied to tenant T1 that allows traffic to communicate between different tiers. And those tiers would be specified through a pod selector indicating which tier traffic would allow incoming traffic from. So here's an example of the backend pods that are allowed traffic to come in from pods on the front end tier on port 80 with the TCP protocol. So there's an example of the network policy that would be applied to the specific endpoints. And the demo that you're going to see shows uh, two uh, instances running in EC2 that are Kubernetes clusters, where we, again, start those uh, uh, pods, as I've described. We start a front end and a back end pod, as well as a replication controller for the various tenants, and then apply the IP addresses. And then, again, specifically, what you're going to see in the demo is uh, creating the new API endpoint by um, applying the third party uh, resource. We're going to launch the pods with uh, different values for the uh, owner label to provide different isolated tenants. Then we're going to launch pods in replication controller and then apply the network policy and show how that policy is then enforced. Hopefully, you've learned a lot about cloud native SDN and how can, Romana can build third party, sorry, build uh, multi tenant networks in Kubernetes version 1.2. Hopefully, you'll have time to look at the demo on the next screencast. Thank you.